welcome to Liberty Me's interview series, The Charming Offensive. I am your host, Tiffany Madison, and today I will be speaking with Michael Lotby, a former medical student turned political advisor and columnist for The Washington Times and Ben Swath's Truth and Media Project. Michael is also the Executive State Director for the Tennessee Tenth Amendment Center. Thank you for joining me today, Michael. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm very excited to chat with you because your activism is both inspiring and very principled and I'm sure you'll agree we live in very interesting times and between the Tea Party movement and Occupy movement and now more bur you know recently the burgeoning liberty movement inspired by Dr. Paul it seems that Americans are more politically engaged than ever and one way that they're engaged is through the nullification activism process which is something that you're very familiar with and their efforts are on the rise and I know those secession petitions were kind of a exercise in protest, but between marijuana and marriage and gun control, Obamacare, Common Core, it seems like those efforts are on the rise. How have these pushbacks surprised you, and what do you think is the root cause? Um, you know, I think to, if, if there is a root cause, it's just a gross lack of understanding between the difference of principles and values. Um, you know, the, the pushback comes from Democrats and Republicans, but it just depends on which issue it is that we're discussing. So what's really fascinating is, is that Republicans are, you know, more than willing most of the time or some of the time to at least entertain the idea of nullifying, um, you know, Obama's gun control or Obamacare or uh, Common Core or the EPA or these other things. Um, and then all of a sudden, if in that same conversation, a Democrat would turn around and say, well, okay, then, uh, you know, we're going to nullify, uh, you know, a federal gay marriage law or the federal ban on marijuana. Uh, then all of a sudden, Republicans will act like they have no idea what you're even talking about. What do you mean nullification? Or, or you, you know, you can't do that. Or, well, the government, if that's the federal government, can, so they're allowed to do that, you know. Um, and then the inverse is true as well. If you have States like, um, you know, Colorado or Washington who have, uh, you know, fought back against the federal government on marijuana and, and they may not want to call it nullification, but that's essentially what they're doing. Um, you know, they're, they're disregarding the federal law on the basis of the fact that the states are delegated this power. So, you know, the liberal states, obviously, they can call it whatever they want to, but regardless, they're nullifying the federal law with regards to marijuana. And then all of a sudden, if a Republican in that same state says, well, okay, well, we're going to nullify, uh, you know, Obamacare or federal gun laws, et cetera, then all of a sudden they're like, well, what do you mean? You can't do that. You know, that's, that's, that's a part of the, you know, the federal government's law. You can't, you know, there's the supremacy clause and all of these things. So... You know, like I said, it's it's it just depends on the issue of whether or not they want to actually agree with the fact that you have to listen to every single thing the federal government says, which to me just illustrates a gross lack of understanding between principles and values. Because if you look at all these issues, um, they're values issues. You know, uh, should the federal government be able to legislate, uh, you know, marijuana or gay marriage, et cetera, et cetera? Well, these are all like, you know, buzzword values that you know we talk about, but in reality, the principle, um, you know, is to actually look at the Constitution and say, you know, Article 1, Section 8 delegates less than two dozen powers to the federal government. Is marijuana, gay marriage, you know, EPA, Obamacare, any of these things, are they actually in the Constitution as it is written? The answer, of course, is no. And so when you take the principled approach, uh, you will find that you can usually make common ground with people because you say, well, you know, I'm a conservative and I don't agree with, you know, marijuana or gay marriage or whatever it is. And, you know, I'm going to go ahead and say, well, you know, the federal government shouldn't be doing that because when the federal government does that, that allows them to then bring in Common Core or the EPA or Obamacare. And so if you can approach these things from a principled perspective, then you have a very effective argument with Democrats and Republicans um, because you can turn their argument against themselves. But like I said, the problem is, is that no one wants to talk about principles. Um, you know, they want to talk about their own issue, which nine times out of 10 is a values issue and not an actual principle issue. 
Yeah, one of those um, big efforts I've noticed and something that you know you're very passionate about is Obamacare. And uh, my second question concerns the open letter that you wrote that went uh, near viral. And in that letter, you announced your resignation from medical school due to Obamacare's devastating impact on the medical profession. Since SCOTUS has ruled on the ACA's alleged constitutionality, you know, this disastrous program has been fraught with failure. You know, what do you think is the future and how, I mean, are we actually going to see that implemented or do you think you're going to see more pushback? Uh, well, you know, unfortunately, Obamacare is here to stay. Um, it's it's certainly not going away because even the Republicans who, on the federal level who say they're against Obamacare, um, there's only probably three or four, maybe maybe there's definitely less than a dozen uh, split between the Senate and the House that actually truly want to defund Obamacare 100%. Now. It's it, you see this, then they give this question. They say, "Well, okay, well, if if Obamacare is so bad, then what's your solution?" You know, that's the Democrats, you know, rebuttal to the Republican who says that they want to end Obamacare. Well, then they say, "Well, we're going to give our own plan," or "Well, this is what our plan is," or you know, Romneycare, whatever care. Uh, so Obamacare isn't going anywhere. It may change names to you know John McCain Care or. Uh, you know, whatever it is, but the federal takeover is here to stay. Now, of course, the states obviously have the right um, to fight back, whether they use nullification or they use anti-commandeering doctrine to effectively say that, um, you know, in the state of Tennessee, for example, where you and I are, um, you know, the state of Tennessee is not going to provide any material support whatsoever. Anyone who contracts with the state of Tennessee cannot contract, uh, you know, with the federal government on health care legislation. All state agencies and political divisions of the state of Tennessee cannot assist to implement the federal health care law in any way whatsoever. So this is anti-commandeering doctrine, and that's actually a 100 um, percent legal maneuver to take. The Supreme Court itself has handed this down over 180 years on four separate Supreme Court cases. Um, and, and one of those cases actually in and of itself was the Obamacare case, NFIB versus Sebelius. In this very case, a lot of people say, oh, well, they found Obamacare constitutional, you know. Well, number one, they didn't find Obamacare constitutional. What they actually did was redefine the law. They legislated from the bench. Um, so Obamacare in and of itself was actually not constitutional. The Supreme Court changed Obamacare to make it constitutional. What they also did, though, was they said that um, the states cannot be coerced or commandeered in any way whatsoever to implement the law. And this goes with all federal laws, whether it's a constitutional law or unconstitutional law. Any federal law, no matter how constitutional it is, the states have the ability to say, in this state, we are not going to fund that law. We're not giving you any assistance. Um, no buildings, no electricity, no water, no utilities, no uh, state employees, etc., to be a part of this. Now, what that does is, is it sets up this paradigm. And a lot of people say, oh, the federal government's so big, they have limitless supplies. That's actually not true. Um, you know, they are certainly limited. And so if 10, 15 states actually came in, and passed anti-commandeering legislation, then the Obamacare legislation in and of itself would collapse because there's no way what it does is it requires the federal government to go into every state, set up offices, uh, use resources, hire employees, et cetera, et cetera, to actually implement the federal law. They can't afford to do that. And a perfect example is to look at Colorado's um, marijuana you know, industry. In the state of Colorado, if they were to pass, you know, some sort of anti-commandeering legislation or the federal government actually had to pay for 100 percent of the DEA's expenses to go into Colorado and eradicate the entire industry, it would take over seven years of the DEA's entire budget just to take on that one state. So, sure, the feds have a lot of money. But they don't have limitless resources, and they actually can't afford to come in and do these things. So could you imagine in, in Colorado if they were to use anti-commandeering legislation on guns, Obamacare, the EPA, Common Core, uh, and the, uh, 
the DEA for their marijuana industry, it would take decades of um, of resources just in that one state for the feds to actually implement every federal law. A lot of people don't understand is is that the states are actually working with the federal government, giving the federal government money, um, you know, tax exemptions or or uh, state employees are being used to do this. They're using the state's electricity, their infrastructure, their buildings, etc. And so, you know, effectively, you put up an incredible barrier when you use this type of legislation that the Supreme Court itself has validated that we can use. The problem is, is even in the states, though. Um, Republicans won't do it either. So if you if you go to any Republicans campaign website, obviously we're moving into campaign season, you go to any Republicans campaign website, they're going to tell you how bad Obamacare is and how much they hate Obamacare. And, uh, you know, it's really fascinating, especially on the state level, because to hear a state legislator talk about it makes no sense, really, because you say, okay, well, this is a federal law, and you're a state, you know, senator. So if you really don't believe that you can do anything as a state senator to Obamacare, then why the hell are you even talking about it? You know, because it's a buzzword and they know it's going to get them reelected. But the truth is, is that some of them know that as a state legislature, you do indeed have the power to stop federal laws within your state uh, if you so choose to. However, uh, it's a very, very small minority of Republicans that are actually willing to do it. And therefore, you know, Obamacare is, is definitely here to stay, unfortunately. Yeah, it's an it's a lack of willingness to nullify in general uh, that I find very disappointing, and that actually brings me to my next question uh, regarding your feud with uh, Mark Levin, which I followed throughout its uh, its life and was a. Uh, very entertained. Um, but, you know, for people who don't know, Mark Levin is a media establishment conservative commentator. Uh, he wrote a book called The Liberty Amendments, Restoring the American Republic, and uh, it caught significant attention. And in this book, Levin proposes that an Article 5 constitutional convention is what is required to say what remains of the Constitution. And you publicly disagreed, stating that our federal government is lawless, supporting your argument with, you know, an entire list of, you know, treasonous acts, in my opinion. Um, additional amendments would do nothing to restore liberty. He wasn't happy with your well-reasoned arguments. And, uh, you know, I have a, I have a theory, but I'm, I'm interested to hear what you think as to why a professed conservative like Levin would so enthusiastically discourage nullification, and why do you think he was fearful to debate you? Well, you know, the truth of Mark is, is that Mark wants to fancy himself a new founding father. Um, and so what Mark's whole plan is, most likely, is to, uh, obviously he's trying to start this movement, and he wants to be ringleader of the movement. Um, and, you know, I think, or I believe that he's hoping that the history books will remember him as someone who started the movement and provided the legal representation uh, for, you know, future amendments to the United States Constitution. So I think that's why Mark is so passionate about uh, the amendment process uh, and so unwilling to look at other options because he's put all of his eggs in this basket. Now, if you actually know the history of Mark Levin, uh, Mark was actually extremely anti-constitutional convention um, only a couple of years before he wrote his book. And then I guess he eventually caught wind that he could, you know, make a lot of money off of this idea because it was starting to catch some steam and he figured, oh, you know, I can be the ringleader of this. I have this massive outlet with all of these followers. Um, so then all of a sudden he jumped ship. You know, we may see him in five or six years jump ship and actually say that nullification is real too. Um, but the point being is that, you know, Mark has put all of his eggs in this in this basket, and you know the the way to fix our government there's there's it's for some reason has become you know this two dichotomies either nullification or constitutional convention, and for some reason the two sides argue with one another. Now I never personally attacked Mark. Mark came after us and has been going after us for a couple of years now, uh, and he calls us crazy and that we're kooks and we have no idea what we're talking about. And then he uses logical fallacies, of course, all the time and, and misinterprets what the founders actually said about nullification purposefully so to mislead people. And so what I did in the article was is I just perfectly laid out what the founders actually said and actually cited them. 
um, and cleared up this sort of ambiguity that he created because, um, you know, there was a time where James Madison said that, you know, we couldn't nullify this. And so what Mark Levin does is he says, well, Madison is saying that nullification is dumb, it's wrong in totality, there's no such thing, you can't do it. Well, what Mark was referencing was James Madison actually speaking about uh, Vice President Calhoun at the time, who was trying to nullify an actual constitutional law. And James Madison said, well, this isn't what nullification is for, so no, you can't use nullification here. But Levin leaves that entire part out about that law actually being constitutional and about Levin, or I'm sorry, Madison, literally six or seven lines down the page going on to confirm nullification is real. You can use nullification, et cetera, et cetera, but not on this. So Levin leaves that whole part out of the history, of course. But I think, like I said, Levin just wants to uh, be the ringleader of a movement. And if people are on board with nullification, then they may not be on board with the constitutional amendment process. Now, I'm not very, you know, strongly so, you know, oh, I hate the Constitutional Convention. I mean, that is something that's there in the Constitution. It's a process for us to use if we have to use it. But people are failing to ask this simple question, and it is, is the Constitution broken or is the federal government lawless? You know, and, and that's the question where we say, do we use a constitutional amendment or do we need to nullify laws? And so perfect example would be, uh, you know, slavery, if you will. So slavery was written into the United States Constitution in its infancy. Now, we can look at that and say, well, this is, you know, this is wrong. This is bad. Um, this is a defect within the Constitution that we need to fix. And so when you have that, that's when you actually have an amendment to the Constitution. Now, when the federal government is lawless and they're not listening to the Constitution in the first place, they're not following what it says, they use it as toilet paper in the White House, that's when you have to say, well, what does it matter if we amend it? They're, they're just going to do the same thing a couple years down the road. These are band-aids. Sure, it may fix the problem for a couple years or so, but until what point does the Supreme Court then turn around and start to rewrite the laws like they have been doing, uh, you know, for the past 200 years or so? And so that's when we say, okay, well, clearly an amendment's not going to work because the government's not listening to what's there right now. So in this case, we need to have an actual nullification of the law. Yeah, and that's uh, speaking of lawlessness. Um, you know, I have two more questions for you. But you know, you describe yourself as a Persian American, and we've discussed before on Facebook and interactions when the the war drums were beating to attack Iran for you know the fifth or sixth time. Um, you know, and we've discussed the obsession that the chicken hawks and the warmongers in Washington have with annihilating and destroying Iran. You know, tensions have cooled for now, but what do you think is the root cause of their cries for war, and what can, what can Iran do to calm those tensions? Well, you know, Iran is in the middle of a, you know, a presidential change right now. Not that that necessarily means anything, um, because the regime is still the same. Um, but, you know, the presidents are obviously changing right now or, or have been for the past couple of years. So they're sort of re-situating under that new presidency, um, you know. But the issue is, is, you know, just how, you, you know, the issue isn't necessarily Iran so much as it is America. Um, you know, and, and let's just be frank and honest, you know, the issue here is, is the war lobby. Um, you know, they, they obviously, the war profiteers, you know, they, they can't wait to, to drop the next bomb on whatever country it is. Now, that's not to say that Iran has not been an irresponsible country or is not doing things that are incredibly irresponsible. Uh, they certainly do. Um, but at the same time, there is this constant need for America to put their nose where it doesn't belong so that we can beat the drums of war. A perfect example is a couple months ago to read uh, all of the articles, and I'm sure anybody could Google it and it would still pop up, this idea that Iran was sending warships towards the American coast. Now, there's an old running joke in Iran. It goes, how do you sink an Iranian battleship? And you put it in water. I mean, 
that's it's that simple. These these warships are literally uh, rust buckets with with paint on them. If, if if you could even afford the paint, there's no such thing as you know this massive Iranian military that's some sort of real true threat. If America wanted to. Uh, you know, they could take out the entire Iranian Navy fleet in, in you know, a couple hours. Um, but I honestly don't believe that there will be a war between America and Iran simply because Iran is not Iraq, um, you know, or Afghanistan. Those two countries are very different, and uh, it comes down to sort of this Arab versus Persian, uh, you know, geoclimate sort of situation where... You, you look at those countries, and people tend to believe that the Middle East, in in its entirety, is just a desert with a bunch of people living in huts. But you know, Iran is very similar to uh, San Diego. I mean, if you go to San Diego, that's basically uh, like being in Iran. So, uh, in Tehran, ex explicitly the the actual capital of Iran. So. It's, you know, mountainous and gorgeous, and there's water, and there's skiing, and there's, um, you know, millions of people, and it's a very thriving metropolis. Um, so, whereas, you know, you had Iraq and Afghanistan, these, these countries have an economy, you know, one-fifteenth the size of Iran. So, for, you know, America to actually start anything with Iran... Uh, that would become a next war would truly be the next world war because we're not talking Iraq or, or uh, Afghanistan here. Iran is a massive country with a large economy with a lot of resources. Um, so it would be, we, we would have to be very ready, I guess you would say, to actually get into a war with Iran because um, it would it would be huge. It would be massive. It would be nothing like this, I, the Iraq War, Afghanistan, or any of that stuff. I mean, a, a war with Iran would be 10, 15, 20 times larger, um, you know. And, and I think the best thing that any of us can do right now really and truly is to use some diplomacy. Um, you know, America, we don't have to be the police of the world. Um, and Iran needs to, you know, really calculate the way that they speak and they interact and, uh, you know, everything else and not make idle threats because the government in Iran certainly has made idle threats. Um, you know, that's not, that's not a lie that's perpetrated by the military industrial complex. Um, you know, Iran is a country of, you know, all bark and no bite, essentially. Right. Um, and, and America is a reactionary country that, you know, hears a bark and, and shoots the dog no matter what, so. That's, a, that's actually a great analogy. Um, one thing that I really do, and, and it would sink the global economy um, and probably tank what's left of the dollar, but, um, and, you know, send oil prices through the roof, and these are all consequences that I know our uh, bureaucrats in Washington I, I hardly consider when they're on the podium screaming for all these conflicts. But um, and one thing that I hope will prevent us from, you know, getting into preventative wars as well is obviously the rising libertarian movement and this kind of conservatarian um, vibe that is soaking into the GOP. And this kind of brings me to my last question. So I know you describe yourself as a conservative, but you're very liberty-minded. And you know, it's no secret that in 2016 it's going to be a very interesting period for you know the liberty movement, inspired by Dr. Paul. Uh, it's going to be an interesting year for the GOP. And it's also no secret that establishment conservatives, Tea Party activists, what's left of them, um, and libertarians really struggle to cooperate within the GOP, especially, you know, either at the state level or when these conventions come around to nominate a president. Are there any policy policy initiatives, you know, maybe the, the top policy initiative you think that could unite all of those factions? That's a tough one, man. Um, you, you know, I... Oof. How do you even answer that? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there is something that unites all of those fractions except for maybe... Um, you know, an economical perspective or a tax perspective. Um, guns typically would probably do it as well. But, you know, anything else outside of that, no, I don't see much unity there. You know, I, I call myself a conservatarian. I kind of think I did coin the phrase like a year and a half ago, and I've seen people start to use it, so I'm happy about that. Um, you know, but at the same time, I think what it takes is ruthless pragmatism, as um, as uh, Frank Underwood put it. Um, you know, 
you've got to be pragmatic. And what I really see the issue with a lot of libertarians is, is they are not pragmatic and they're not willing to be pragmatic. And unfortunately, what you, what you have is, is a lot of people who are like that, they've never spent a day uh, at Legislative Plaza in, in D.C. or in their state or anywhere else. They don't understand the actual process um, and what it takes to actual make, actually make change happen. They truly don't understand. And um, it, I'm not trying to be demeaning or uh, insulting to anyone, but I do see that a lot within the libertarian movement. And it was something that really actually pushed me away. I mean, if we're being completely honest, it's something that pushed me away from actually calling myself a libertarian, um, was just the complete lack of pragmatism uh, that I found within the party. And like I said, I think you have to actually have spent time in the legislative process to understand uh, what you're really dealing with. And I don't think that a lot of them have, or a lot of people in general, obviously, have never walked into their state capitol and have ever actually written a bill and got it sponsored and seen what happens to legislation as you move it down the uh, committee process. And that's something that I've done, and so it has really awakened my eyes to actually understand uh, what has to be done in the process that we have to use. So, you know, the truth be told, when I first got involved in politics and was very excited, I was the same way. I was very, um, I wasn't pragmatic, you know, I wanted change, I wanted it now, I wanted, you know, if, if a bill was going forward and it said that it was going to stop the NSA and it didn't stop the NSA by the time it passed and then we passed the bill anyways and it only did you know, even a three-fourths of what it was supposed to do, then, you know, I would get furious and upset and, you know, we would, we would, you know, protest these legislators and stuff. But then, you know, actually getting involved in taking legislation there and, and lobbying for it, I now see that if I could get a bill that did three-fourths of what I wanted it to do when I first started, then that would be magical. Um, what you actually get is maybe one-twentieth if that, of, of what your bill actually set out to do. And so I look at the legislative process the same way I look at this cultural or sociocultural, uh, you know, change within the libertarian movement and et cetera on a national level. I, you know, I always tell people who get upset about these things or, or about what Rand Paul is doing or, or this or that, I always say, you know, communism, fascism, socialism, whatever ism you want to, you know, corporatism, whatever you want to call America, um, did not come here waving a red flag saying, vote for me. You know, it didn't happen overnight. And so there's no way that we're going to fix this overnight. We have to be ruthlessly pragmatic and we have to take this one bite at a time. And so I think that if there's anything that, you know, would unite people and stop all of this bickering, it would be this idea of people understanding how to actually fight the fight. We're not fighting the fight correctly. You know, we're going to these protests and we're screaming our heads off and we're taking our loaded guns to D.C. And, and I understand the dissent and, and why we're unhappy and why we're pissed off. Trust me, I do. But on the other side of this, you have to understand you're not going to get anything done that way. And, and the only way to get things done is to unfortunately take this one bite at a time, and it may be, you know, 15, 20, 30 years before we actually get our country back. Um, but it's either going to be that or, you know, an all-out violent revolution in the middle of the streets. And, um, you know, I think if libertarians are honest and true about their intentions to be, uh, you know, nonviolent and um, et cetera, then, then you have to either say, we're going to be ruthlessly pragmatic about this, and we're going to take the necessary steps, and we're going to get it done. That doesn't mean we're not going to hold people accountable. We're going to hold them accountable, um, but we're going to understand the process that we have to use to get this thing done. Or we're going to go ahead and take our guns to D.C. and start shooting. Um, and, and, and then there's really no in-between ground there. You know, you're either going to use the process that we have to fix this the same way we got in the situation in the first place, or you're going to lead a violent revolution. Um, and, and so I think that's what I really loved about, you know, Ron Paul, and especially even Rand Paul right now, because people are pissed off about what Rand is doing, but they don't understand the pragmatism that it takes to actually uh, inspire and incite change. 
you know, if 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 it was that easy, then we would never be in this situation in the first place because Ron Paul doing what he was doing uh, would have fixed everything, right? I mean, the guy's been in Congress for decades. So if it was that easy, then, you know, he would have already fixed it. So, you know, th there's this idea of time and patience and pragmatism. And I think that if we all start teaching each other that, um, and, and having some patience and understanding the process and actually truly getting involved in the process, uh, then we could actually see some pretty substantial gains. But unless that happens, I really, uh, I hate to be a pessimist, um, you know, but I think that, uh, you, you know, we're in trouble here because we can't unite the party because, like I said, the libertarian fraction wants it today. Actually, they want it yesterday. Um, and it's not that I don't want it yesterday. I definitely do. But, you know, I understand uh, the pragmatism that it takes to get something done. Um, and then, you know, you've got the Republican establishment who's, you know, you might as well call them Democrats. So we're obviously fighting them, uh, but we're fighting libertarians, too, and we're fighting Tea Party. So we're all fighting each other. Um, you know, so it's going to take some pragmatism and understanding how to work with each other and working with each other on issues that we agree with. And on issues that we don't agree with, there's no need to argue about it because we're not going to change it anyways. So if it's something we can't agree on, then just shut up about it and let's not talk about it anymore, you know? But. Well, I, I appreciate that. I think what we will see is a lot of people actually running for office, uh, particularly, you know, our generation. Um, you know, the people that have been serving since, you know, Nixon was in office, um, they've got to go. So, you know, eventually who's going to replace them? And I think we will see an uptick in people, especially libertarian leaning or, or liberty minded individuals, a lot of veterans um, that are, are very angry with what has uh, taken place in American politics and the wars they've been sent off to are uh, definitely going to be running for office as well. Well, thank you so much. It was a very interesting interview and I hope we can speak again in the future. Uh, if you want to check out Michael's work, you can follow him on Twitter. If you want to support the 10th Amendment Center, you can go to 10thamendmentcenter.com. Thank you so much, Michael. Take care. Have a good one. Thanks.